guys would, would have this really intense feud for a couple of months, then it would go away, then it would come back, then it would go away, then it would come back. So I know, I know it's really hard for us to talk about Hell in a Cell and try and find some new ground with it. We're going to try. We'll try. So the thing about Hell in a Cell was like, it, that's now the most remembered thing that you guys did together. But in actuality, that wasn't part of really the best part of your feud. So why do you think, and for a long time, you were not really that keen about talking about it. You didn't really want to go into it. It wasn't something that you enjoyed. You wouldn't dare be seen doing a network show about it for an hour yeah. or anything like that. But, right. but you've learned to embrace it. Why? What's changed over time? Yeah, man. I did. I resented being the guy <laughs> who did the cell match. It got to the point where I literally felt like Bill Murray in an airing of Groundhog's Day that never ends. For 15 years, someone will come up to me at least once a day as if it's the first time I'd ever been asked go, did it hurt? <laughs> So I go in, one time I remember, this wasn't specific to the cell match, but on, before I had my hip and knee replaced, I was really struggling to get around. If any of you guys saw my shows, man, you know, I, would, I did more sitting at those shows than I did here, you know? I was like, oh, I was pretty much just immobile. It was painful to watch me get around. I remember getting out at like the Jiffy Lube place and it just, it took me about five minutes to get out of my car and going and I limped so noticeably and the guy goes, yeah, I guess that wrestling really takes its toll on you, huh? And I go, yeah. And he goes, did you ever get hurt? Like, it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard after acknowledging that wrestling takes its toll on you. And then I was in Kansas City and uh, I do a Q&A like we're going to do tonight. And there's this kind of tough you know, cowboy guy, you know, in the audience. And he doesn't ask a question, but he waits into the Q he waits to the meet and greet afterward. He comes up and I think he did it to protect my image. You know, some kind of tough guy. And he goes, hey, uh. I noticed when The Undertaker threw you off that cell that you landed on a table. <laughs> and he leans forward and he whispers in my ear, he goes, it broke your fall, didn't it? <laughs> and I realized he was on to me. <laughs> I said, yeah, it did. So he goes, so you didn't get hurt? And I went, not at all. And I leaned forward and whispered in his ear, and I said, it was a magic table. <laughs> but I did, I resented it to the point where I expected it. And Barry Blau, to give you an example, Barry Blaustein, the guy who directed Beyond the Mat, had a favor he wanted me to do. And he's like, yeah, um, I'm just wondering, I'm doing this job, and I wonder if you can meet a friend of mine's kids, they're big fans, his name's Brian Grazer. And I call him back, you want me to meet Brian Grazer's kids? Like, this is, this will be easy. So I go to Imagine Entertainment, you know, and they, Mr. Foley, Mr. Grazer's waiting for it. They usher me all the way to the top, and I'm overlooking Los Angeles. And the, I go, anything you guys want to know? I go, oh, I got a question. Oh, I got a question. So, okay, here it comes. He goes, did it hurt when the big show threw you off the stage into the grave? Does anyone remember that? A smackdown buried alive. Me and The Rock against Big Show and The Undertaker, right? And it was such a relief, and I was like, actually, I was so relieved that I made it into the grave that I didn't even think about being hurt. Because if you guys see it, like given my lack of natural athleticism, right? I made up for it in creativity, right? Imagination, I remember walking with Big Show and we're on the stage, I was like, do you think, if I got a head start, could you throw me off this stage? into that grave and he said you know I can <laughs> and it wasn't like you rehearsed it you know there were no crash pads it was just you ready here we go and it was like brother and I took flight you know and I just hit that thing it was like a hole in one and got like boom, and I was in the grave and there's this crazy at that time Big Show was kind of jacked right he was like 350 and he had abs and there's this photo <laughs> it did it did it, it only, it only makes sense to wrestling fans. Like, I, I put out a photo, and Facebook refused to let me uh, to let me promote it. They said this: we cannot promote this. It has <laughs> sexual content or innuendo. <laughs> and it was like, hey, wrestling fans don't need a reason 
why a guy with a leather mask has his fingers down the throat of a dead man while having his missing ear look licked by a man painted in gold. It just, it just makes perfect sense, right? It's wrestling. In the, sa- in the same way, it's like, do we need an explanation why a man is coming out of a grave with a sweat sock and applying it to a seven foot two inch giant in black underwear? Absolutely not. It's professional wrestling and it makes total sense to us, right? But that was the point I was where I, I you know, I, I did, I, I, you know, I, I disliked being the guy uh, known for that one match because there are other things I want to be known for. It kind of felt overwhelming. And then there were three, and I touched on this in my special, you know, the 20 Years of Hell special. But I think it's important, especially if one of them deals with a backstage visit for The Undertaker. There were three primary things that changed my mind. Uh, the first of which was my wife told me that... Uh, my children had heard about this match in school. These are my younger children, like eight and 10 at the time, and they wanted to see it. And I said, are you sure they're ready for that? And they go, the kids in school are already talking about it. And so we waited for them to come home, and I watched that match in its entirety for the first time in many years. Like, we all see the clips. If you have a chance to go back and watch it in its entirety, man, it's, it's, <laughs> It still packs a wall up, right? It's heavy, you know? And, and what I took from it was this incredible dedication to getting over the finish line, you know, by whatever means it took, you know? And it's this strange thing, because it, obviously things went wrong, you know? Didn't go like we'd hoped. And you see, you know, human beings trying to pick up the pieces with help from wherever we could get it. Terry Funk entered the ring and he was choke slammed by The Undertaker. And this was a key thing because I went back and I watched that match a hundred times, right? Sections of the match in the days that followed because I didn't actively remember too much of the match because I'd been knocked unconscious. And I went back, Mr. McMahon was nice enough. I did wrestle the next night. I did wrestle the next night and a very short match, and I went home for four days. I must have watched pieces of that match for a hundred times. And it was clear to me that when Terry Funk entered the ring, it's Funk with an N, I'm still at zero on the F-bomb scale, right? (laughs) That uh, there were words shared between The Undertaker and Terry Funk, but they were just said so casually that I never once asked my wife, my friends, anyone, like, I wonder what words were shared. And it was just, boom, words were shared, and then uh, you see Terry, he goes over and he like touches my face, he comes back to The Undertaker, and he gets choke slammed. And in the process, Terry's shoes came off his feet. (laughs) And so legitimately, after being out for almost a minute, you know, I rolled over and people were like, what were you thinking, what was going through your head? And I was like, I swear to you, the only thing I could think of was, where'd those shoes come from? (laughs) I I had no answer for where those shoes came from. But that was was the first of of three life experiences that changed my mind. The second one was I was doing the one man show and and, uh, Taker came by backstage to, uh, to see me and he was with his wife, and people might wonder why I'd be surprised, because we've known each other since 1989. Like, wouldn't he call you or text you? And I'm like, I know things are different with social media, but at the time, it's like, he's the undertaker. He doesn't use text messages. He doesn't use emojis, you know? He shows up in person and he surprises you. And we had this talk, and I had completely forgotten the situation he was in, his physical condition. Does anyone remember what he entered, the way he entered the ring? Broken ankle, right? Broken foot, broken ankle to the point where when I go through that cell and I'm unconscious, he's got to hang, he's got suspended several feet above that mat and he drops down and he's hobbling noticeably. And we reminisce, like I'd completely forgotten about our feet sinking through the 
you know, through the mesh. And it's funny the things that you remember vividly. Like I said, like a lot of that was a fog to me and I picked up the pieces over the weeks, months, and even years. What Undertaker vividly recalls was the sound the twist ties were making as they were springing off the structure. They're just going, bing, <laughs> so, bing. <laughs> like, we should have realized, you know, like I said, it was a harbinger of things to come because I had watched that Shawn Michaels match with The Undertaker and it was because of that match and how great it was that I felt compelled to do something no one had ever done before, no one had ever thought of before and I told The Undertaker like, if we can find a way to do things no one's ever done before, no one's ever thought of before, maybe we can make people think they're seeing a great match, even if they aren't. And uh, we went up there and it's, <laughs> Twist ties are shooting off the building. So if you go back and watch when I take that choke slam, I'm laying amidst like three or four twist ties laying on the canvas. Watch and go back. It's really interesting to see that I attempt to suplex the Undertaker on top of that dilapidated cell, and brother, he shot that shit down in a hurry. <laughs> like, not happening under my watch. Uh, but the third life lesson was Terry Funk giving my Hall of Fame speech and induction. And it was beautiful, and it was funny, it was poignant, and it was brief. And that's important in the days of seven and a half hour induction spectaculars, right? Uh, Hell belly fucking Jim. <laughs> if we all listen closely, we can still hear Hillbilly Jim talking. Uh, but I'm. I'm getting ready to go out, keeping in mind Madison Square Garden was the arena where I grew up, hitchhiking to, taking trains to, it's where I saw Jimmy Stucca dive off the top of the cell and I was so fortunate to be able to be inducted in the arena that meant so much to me. And I'm behind the curtain, like right here, where that curtain is here, and I listen as Terry Funk relays to the people out there in the garden and therefore like around the world, the words that were shared between he and The Undertaker. Remember I said they're just so casual? He said The Undertaker walked up to him, very simply said, see if he's alive. <laughs> see if he's alive. And so when Terry went over and I said, it looks weird, he's touching my face, he was taking my pulse to see if I was alive. He came back and he reported to The Undertaker, he's still breathing. <laughs> At which point, The Undertaker choke slammed Terry Funk out of his shoes. Because... <laughs> In WWE at that time, we didn't stop matches, right? Now we would. We'd be the wise move, the smart move. Uh, because we learned so much about head injuries. Like, uh, no question, there'd be the, the, the move to make, the move that would be made. But at that time, 1998, we didn't stop matches. We bought time. And that's what Terry and The Undertaker were attempting to do, attempting to buy me time. And you see the clip, I mean, I was watching from back there when The Undertaker punches me and I just crumble over, you know, and I just fall. And it was sad and it was also scary. That's when The Undertaker, this is where I'm gonna confide in you guys. I've never told this story before. He leaned over and he just said a few simple words. He had that long mane of dark red hair and I'll never forget. He just leaned over and he said, hey, are you okay there, fella? <laughs> <laughs> just being honest with you. Oh, doggone it. That was one humdinger of a landing there, pal. Don't worry, he doesn't sound like that. <laughs> he just said two words, he went, go home. You know, wrestle speak for this match is over. And this is, uh, this is when I talked about that ego coming into play. You know, I said it like in this, I don't know what it was. There was like something larger than the two of us out there. The truth is, it was my ego taking offense to anyone, even The Undertaker, telling me when it was time to go home. That's the honest truth. That's what got me up. I don't know how I conveyed that to him verbally. I honestly don't know what it is I said that made him think that I was okay to continue. 
but I was offended that anyone, even the undertaker, would tell me when it was time to go home, you know? And it wasn't like I was being a tough guy about it, because I almost needed to be spoon-fed or bottle-fed. Like, those next two minutes are pretty harrowing, right? Like, he went old school on me, he took me by the wrist, he went up to that top rope, and if I had 100 matches with the undertaker, he probably went old school on like 80 of those occasions. If you don't know what that means, it's like this near seven foot guy walking across the top rope. It's pretty majestic looking. On every other occasion, the rest of my body would be like kind of wildly thrashing about, you know, selling it as we say. But on that occasion, I just, there was no movement at all. My left arm was up in the air like this and I was still gone, you know, like, and I knocked him off the top rope with his cooperation and then like sat against that bottom and middle turnbuckle and let the cloud of, you know, unconsciousness begin to dissipate. And then we pulled it together and we saw the thumbtacks emerged and by God, you know, we got across that finish line. 